This is the third in a series on the Roman Catholic Church. In the first session, we talked about the authority in the Roman Catholic Church, which is the Bible, the Apocrypha, tradition, and the infallibility of the Pope. In the second session, we talked about the origin of the Pope or the papacy. They claim that in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus said, uh, you're Peter, and upon this rock I'll build my church, and so the church is built on Peter. We also saw that that's not the correct interpretation of that passage, and that the origin of the Pope wasn't until 600 years later, around 604 A.D. What I want to do in this session is talk about another part of the doctrine of the Pope. What they teach is that it was started with Peter, and there was an unbroken line of pious popes from Peter to the present. That's a very critical part of the concept of the papacy in Roman Catholicism. The unbroken line of pious popes. I want to discuss that. And so this means we're going to have to discuss a lot of history. I have a text for this, but it doesn't come until the end. But most of this is going to be just a discussion of history. Is it true that there's been an unbroken line of popes? Is it true that those popes have been pious and holy men? Those are basically the two questions I want to grapple with in this session. So I want to start with the first one. An essential element in the concept of the Pope is that there's been a continuous, unbroken line. Is that part true? And the answer is, well, there is a list of popes. But the accuracy of that list has been questioned, to say the least. In the first place, as I explained last time, there was no pope. For 600 years, there was a bishop of Rome, but he was not claiming the kind of authority that the Pope did beginning in 600, where he is claiming universal authority over all Christians. That simply did not exist. So there was no unbroken line in the early days, to be sure. However, there is a list. As a matter of fact, some early church fathers had a list. Well, what about that list that they came up with? Well, the first list that I can find anything about was about 185 A.D., uh, many years deep into the second century. One author said, the succession list that does exist of bishops is seriously unreliable. Another said that it is simply not true that a list of bishops of Rome can be drawn up with certainty. He went on to say that little or nothing is known about the first ten men on the so-called list of popes. And the next ten, of the next ten, ten only one is clearly a clearly defined figure of history. In other words, we don't know anything about those early people that are on the list that are supposed to have been popes in Rome. This author says, and I quote, The fact of the matter is, the historical record is so incomplete that the existence of an unbroken succession of apostles to the present can neither be proved or disproved. And he goes on to say, there is not a scholar anywhere who pretends to show any degree, canon, or resolution by any of the ecumenical councils which attempt to give preeminence to one church. The first 600 years of the Christian era know nothing of spiritual supremacy on the part of the Bishop of Rome. End of quote. In other words... There were no popes in the first 600 years. So, the first fallacy of this idea 
is there is no unbroken line in the first 600 years. But there's more. This is what I'm about to say is common knowledge. Anybody who knows anything about the history of popes knows what I'm about to say. There is no succession of pious popes from Peter to the present. In the three, 1300s, a pope lived in France rather than Rome. Gregory XI moved the papacy back to Rome. His successor, Urban VII, he reigned about 1378 to 1389, made an election promise that if he were elected pope, he would return the Vatican back to France. But later, he refused to do that. So France called an election, that election in Rome, illegal, and they elected a rival pope. His name was Clint VII. He reigned about 1378 to 1394. So at this point, we have two popes one in Italy, and one in France. That schism continued from 1378 to 1409, when finally a council deposed both popes and elected a new one, Alexander V. The other two popes, one in Italy and one in France, refused to accept that decision. So now we got three popes at one time. Alexander V was succeeded by John XXIII, whom Roman Catholicism does not recognize as a pope. As a matter of fact, in the 20th century, another pope took the name John XXIII to show the illegality of the first John XXIII. The Council of Constance in 14, 14 through 18 deposed all three and elected a new one, Martin V. I'm not making this up. I'm not, I'm not stretching the truth. You can go to any encyclopedia and see that what I'm telling you is the truth. There is no unbroken line of popes. There were two and at one point three popes all at the same time. Make matters even more interesting. The Catholic Church itself has repeatedly revised the list. In 1939, Pope Pius XIII was inaugurated as the 262nd Pope. Did you get that number? 262. Remember that. That's 1939. In 1947, the Vatican scholars revised the official list of popes and dropped some, added some, questioned some, and reduced the number to 261. For example, there was a man in the list named Anticletus, and there was another man on the list named Cletus. And they decided that those really weren't two different people. Those were two different names for the same person. So they revised the list based on that. Dantus II, who reigned around seven, uh, 973, was dropped when research showed he never existed. Alexander V and John XXIII, 15th century figures, were relegated to the list of anti-popes or false claimants. Now, one of the things that's happened is that a number of times, two people were claiming to be pope at the same time. So these, that's what that statement means. The reign of John XIV in 984 was once divided into two, erroneously adding a non-existent John to the series. In 1958, Pope John XXIII was inaugurated as the 262nd Pope. Remember that number I gave you a minute ago? What was it? 262. So now we got two 262s. But in 1961, still another Pope was deposed, Stephen II of 752. 
And with the inauguration of Paul VI in 1963, he was then accounted by some as Pope number 262. So we got two 262s. Yeah, that's right. How many years apart? 1947, I think this started. 1958? Yeah. 1958. 1961. All right. In 1963, the Pontifical Yearbook that's the official yearbook in the Patterson in the Vatican of the of the popes. Abandoned for the present any attempt to number the popes, giving in its reason the impossibility of determining the validity of some of the names. So my point is there is no unbroken line of popes. There just isn't. That's a fact of history. Two men claimed to be Pope at the same time, and at least at one point, three Popes were claiming to be the Pope at the same time. In their list of Popes, Roman Catholicism includes Popes and a Popes, that's false claimants to the Pope. If you recall last time, I told you I listened to some lectures by a professor at Notre Dame University. The lectures were on the papacy, and he said, and I quote, between 217 and 1449, some three dozen antipopes have laid claim to the papal office. That's 36. In preparation for this series, I actually took a seminary course on Roman Catholicism online. And that professor said there were 39 cases of where there were anti-popes or false claimants to the papacy. So church history does not support the claim that there's an unbroken line of succession of popes from Peter. As has been demonstrated, the first pope wasn't in existence until about 600 A.D. All right, that's the first part. There is no unbroken line of succession. What about this pious part? And this is where it gets real interesting. What is the history of the popes like? The real growth of the papacy took place in the Middle Ages. So what I want to do is I want to talk about this whole idea of these are holy people or pious people and I'm going to start by just talking about how the papacy expanded to include not just spiritual things, but political things. As you well know, the Vatican is a political state as well as a church. How did that happen? Uh, that's not piety, that's politics. Well, all of that began in the Middle Ages. And here's how it started. Rome was the capital of the Roman Empire. Constantine moved the capital to Constantinople, modern-day Istanbul in Turkey. So now the Roman Empire uh, doesn't have two capitals, it only has one, but it left Rome in the dust. At that point, Constantine gave the royal palace to the current bishop of Rome. It's called the Lateran Palace. It still exists. Rome was sacked by the Gauls in 410 and by the Vandals in 455. After 476, there was no emperor in the West. So, it created a power vacuum. And at that point, the most powerful man in town was the bishop who's living in the political palace. So, this all started with that power vacuum that was created by the capital of Rome moving to Istanbul, Constantinople back in those days. 
So as a result, there was no Roman administration to provide justice, defense, and other government services, and the bishops ste stepped in and started fulfilling those functions. Then the church began to accumulate wealth, especially in the form of property. People gave money and land to the church. A professor who is a committed Catholic and teaches at the State University of New York, his name is Cook, said, Some were bargains struck with God for salvation, despite a life of unchurched deeds. So to hoping to buy salvation, they gave money and they gave land, especially, to the church. So the church starts becoming powerful politically. Then politicians got involved. Now their motivation was the church has all this property and has all this wealth so they, they were interested in who controls all this land, the kings at the time. In, the case, in this case it's the bishops or the abbots in monasteries. So the kings used their power to influence who was made bishop and who was made abbot over the monastery. So the kings are now getting involved in the running of the church. By the way, that's really nothing new. Remember Constantine was the head of the Council of Nicaea in 325? That's when political involvement in the church really began. So this is much later, but people are getting involved. The kings were interested in the person's political leanings rather than their piety. What I want to know is, are you going to be loyal to me, the king? So the church and the state are becoming more and more entwined. But here's where it really took off. In the middle of the 8th century, Rome faced an attack by barbarians. The Byzantine emperor, the emperor of the Roman Empire at that point, is where? Constantine. And he's having to worry about the Muslim invaders coming knocking on his door so he can't come over and help Rome. So the pope at the time, in 755, was Stephen III. He crossed the Alps in the middle of winter to go to France and appeal to Pippin, the king of the Franks, for help. But he didn't just ask for protection. He asked for land. Now what I'm about to tell you is a really bit of important historical data. He took with him a document called Donation of Constantine. Now, everybody agrees now that that document was forged. But the document claimed, now this is 755, that way back in the 4th century, in like 350, Constantine gave certain lands to the church. So, when the Pope went to the king for protection, he said, what I really want is the land back. And the king bought the document, fought the war, won, and gave a lot of land in Italy to the church. And that created the papal states. Uh, the papal states were created then and lasted into the 20th century. Now, in the 20th century, it got reduced to just the Vatican. But for a long time, there was a huge hunk of property that belonged to the Catholic Church. So you can see we're getting uh, intertwined with the church and the state. In 799, the Pope crowned the king, Charlemagne which sort of was saying, the Pope has authority over the state. Uh, Cook sums it up like this. 
with its wealth and power, the papacy became a prize for the Roman noble families. Monasteries and bishoprics often fell into the hands of men from the ranks of the military. So when all of this happened, the secular state sort of took over the church, at least the church of Rome. The uh, culmination of this papal power, the, the zenith of it, was between seven, uh, 1073 and 1216. For about 150 years, this power was really, really great. Uh, it was well nigh unto absolute power, not only over the church, but over the nations of Israel. Gregory VII, who reigned in the 11th century, better known as Hildebrand, ruled at the zenith of papal power. That Catholic professor at State University of New York calls him one of the most important popes in the history of the church. He reformed the clergy. It needed reforming at that point. At least he did it temporarily. He ended the purchasing of offices. You could become a bishop by purchasing the office. He stopped that. It came back, but he stopped it. He lifted the standard of morals. He compelled celibacy of the priesthood. He freed the church from the domination of the state by putting an end to the nomination of popes and bishops by kings and emperors and by requiring all accusations against a priest or involving the church to be tried in ecclesiastical courts. In essence, he made the church supreme over the state. State. So I'm simply talking about the expansion of political power. And I could go on and on and on. In January 10,077, the emperor stood for three days in bare feet before the pope because of a squabble. And he was seeking remission of his sins. So he submitted to the Pope, and that sort of sealed at that point that the, that the church is more powerful than the state. Now, I can go on and on and on. I'm just giving you samples. But the point is, there was the expansion of political power. The other thing, and again, what I'm about to say is well documented. Anybody who knows anything about the papacy knows what I'm about to say. The papacy not only expanded in political power, it got corrupted spiritually. It was not only expanded, it was evil. I mean the people in it. The popular impression is that the popes have been pious people, and that is simply not true. Philip Schoft, who is a highly respected church historian, he's a historian, not a theologian, said, and I quote, In 1049, the corruption was so bad that when Pope Louis IX tried to reform the priesthood, he found that enforcing reforms would be well nigh deprive the church, especially in Rome, of their shepherds. If I kicked out all the Corrupt priest, we wouldn't have any left. That's what he's saying. Almost every priest, especially those in Rome, had purchased his position with money and had a concubine. I mentioned the professor at Notre Dame, whose lectures I listened to. His name is Noble. He readily admits there's been corruption in the papacy and gives several outstanding examples. I've quoted the Catholic professor at the State University of New York, whose name is Cook. He is a committed Christian. And he says, I quote, Some popes had mistresses openly in the papal palace and acknowledged their illegitimate children. That's a Catholic professor, not me. A few years ago, Patricia and I took some time off and uh, when we take time off, 
we don't go do, do, do a bunch of stuff. We take time off. We do as little as possible. So we were knocking around doing nothing. And I saw a bookstore. And it was having a sale. You know, they call their inventory. Books are a dollar. Well, I happen to be a lover of books. So I said, hey, let's just go knock around. Let's go look at the books. Reaching through the book tables. And I found a book. It said, Bad Popes. <laughs> and I thought it was a joke. I thought it was published by National Enquirer or something. <laughs> I really did. So I picked it up and I thumbed through it. And I said, hey, wait a minute. This is a scholarly piece of work. He's documenting everything. And with good, reliable sources. Wow. And besides... As I recall, it was only a buck, or maybe it was 50 cents. Sold. So I bought the book and stuck it on my shelf. And said, one of these days, I'm going to study the Roman Catholic Church in detail, and that book will come in handy. Well, in preparation for this series, I read that book. And I'm telling you, it blew my mind. It was so far-fetched. I thought he was kidding. I'd never heard the likes of that. So I had to go check it out. And you know what? He's telling the truth. You can just Google any of this. It's all over the place. And the Catholics readily admit that this happened. Sergius III, who was a 10th century pope, had an illegitimate son. The illegitimate son became the next pope. And he was so bad, the people complained and the emperor had him tried and, and deposed. Quote, some of the sins enumerated in the charge were a murder, perjury, sacrilege, adultery, and incest. End of quote. Alexander VI, who lived in the 15th century, had six illegitimate children, two of whom were born while he was pope. And he was charged with adultery repeatedly. Now, I can go on and on and on. One of my favorite stories in this regard is that this got all political and there were factions and they hated each other. And one pope got elected and he hated his predecessor who was dead. So he dug him up, put him in papal garb, put him on the throne and had a trial. Condemned him. He was found guilty, took off the papal garb, put on secular clothes, and threw him over the wall. And the people picked him up and threw him in the river. And the fishermen fished him out and gave him a decent burial. <laughs> True story. True story. And it's still going on. Do I have to tell an American audience about what's happening in the priesthood in America? And it's not just in America. And it's not just immorality. It's the whole thing of wealth and corruption, both monetarily, politically, and morally. So, when Pope Benedict XVI resigned, and Pope Francis was elected to replace him. Now, that's in your memory, right? You lived through that one. Well, at that point, there were two living popes. Actually, one resigned, but there were two people who had been pope. Well, that hadn't happened for hundreds of years. So speaking to reporters, in August of 2013, Pope Francis said, and I quote, The last time there were two or three popes, they didn't talk among themselves and they fought over who would be the true pope, end of quote. Pope Francis acknowledges what I'm telling you. On October 23rd, 2013, Pope Francis suspended a bishop in Germany because of his lavish lifestyle. The renovation of the church-owned residence ran over budget to cover... $620,000 worth of artwork. 
1.1 million in landscaping and last-minute design renovations. The total was $42 million, all of which was billed to the Vatican and German taxpayers. If you live in Germany, if you go to church, you've got to pay a church tax. So the taxpayers in Germany paid $42 billion, million, not billion, million dollars to renovate the residence of a bishop. The European media dubbed him the Bishop of Billing. <laughs> and that's not an isolated case. A professor at the College of the Holy Cross in Worcester, Massachusetts said, and I quote, In many parts of Asia Af and Africa, Catholic, Catholic bishops live a lifestyle of great luxury while the laity live in poverty. Catholic bishops often have cars and drivers and air-conditioned homes and servants. End of quote. So, over the years, the papacy collected wealth, got involved politically, and got corrupt. Now, that's bad. That's really bad. Let me tell you what's worse, in a sense. It's their exalted claims. I want to tell you what the papacy claims. It's astonishing. When the Pope is installed, at his coronation, a triple crown is placed on his head, and the officiating cardinal says, Receive the tiara, adorned with three crowns, and know that thou art the father of princes and kings, the ruler of the world, and the vicar of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Do you know what the word vicar means? Substitute. He's the substitute for Jesus Christ. In 1885, in his encyclical, Pope Leo XIII declared the Pope holds, quote, upon the earth the place of God Almighty, end of quote. He's vicar. The New York Catechism says, the Pope takes the place of Jesus Christ on earth. By divine right, the Pope has supreme and full power in faith and morals over each and every pastor in his flock. He is the true vicar of Christ, the head of the entire church, the father and teacher of all Christians. He is the infallible ruler, the founder of dogma, the author and judge of councils, the universal ruler of truth, the arbitrator of the world, the supreme judge of heaven and earth, the judge of all being judged by no one, God himself on the earth, end of quote. The Pope, after all I've told you, claims he stands in the place of Christ on the earth. He's the vicar of Christ. Thus the Roman Catholic Church holds that the Pope is vicar of Christ on the earth. He is the ruler of the world, supreme not only over the Roman Church itself, but over all kings, Presidents, silver rulers, indeed over all people of all nations. They have excommunicated and deposed kings and governors, as in the cases of Queen Elizabeth I of England and Emperor Henry IV of Germany. They have attempted to arouse rebellion by releasing subjects, alliance, allegiance, I should say, to their king. So one author said... The Pope thus demands a submission of his people and indeed of all people so far as he is able to make it effective, which is due only to God. Sometimes that submission has cardinals, the next highest ranking official in the Roman Church, prostrating themselves before the Pope and kissing his feet. Have you ever seen that? You know where have I speak? 
Remember that. That's important. The popes have gone so far in assuming the place of God that they even insist on being called Holy Father. Have you ever heard that? His Holiness. You ever heard that? What's that? Claiming to be in place of Christ. Such titles apply, applied to man, are of course blasphemous. We cannot but wonder, one author said, what goes through the mind of a pope when people thus reverence him, carrying him on their shoulders, kissing his hands and feet, hailing him as the Holy Father and performing acts of worship before him. By such means, this so-called vicar of Christ accepts the position of the ruler of the world which the devil offered to Christ, but which Christ refused to accept. Interesting. This author goes on to say the triple crown of the Pope wears symbolically his authority in heaven, on earth, and in the underworld as king of heaven, as king on earth, and king of hell in that through his absolution, souls are admitted to heaven. On the earth, he attempts to exercise political as well as spiritual power, and through his special jurisdiction over the souls in purgatory, he exercises the power of the keys, and he can release whatever souls he pleases from further suffering, and those he refused to release continue in their suffering. The decision he makes on earth being ratified, he claims, in heaven. It's unbelievable. They are claiming he stands in the place of Christ and has all of the authority over everybody on earth. Have you ever heard the expression, all power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely? Have you ever heard of that? Let me tell you who said that. A guy named Lord Acton, when he visited Rome to examine it himself. And when Lord Acton saw, he was a historian, when he saw what was happening in Rome, he said, by the way, he was a Catholic. And he's the one that wrote, all power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Now, folks, Who's the vicar of Christ on the earth? When the Lord left, who took his place? The Holy Spirit. And when Christ was on the earth, did they kiss his feet? Or did he wash their feet? That's how far they've gotten away from being like Christ. So, the sum is simply this. The papacy, the Pope, developed, I explained that in detail in the second session, expanded, I've talked about that in this session, was often evil during the Middle Ages, and yet they make the most exalted claims. It's unbelievable. I think it's astonishing that any man would claim to stand in the place of Christ. Have people kiss his feet when you're standing in the place of Christ? He would never have done that. So here's the point. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I told you I had a text. Well, if I'm going to point to it, you know I'm coming to a close. Here's the text. There's a spiritual lesson here. This is not a history lesson. This is a spiritual lesson. You've got to know the history to get the spiritual lesson, but here's the spiritual lesson. One verse 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1. Paul said, imitate me. 
Paul said, follow me. Paul said, I want you to do exactly what I do. As I also imitate Christ. If you're going to pick out a spiritual leader, and no spiritual leader is perfect, then you follow him and imitate him only in those areas in which he is following and imitating Jesus Christ. It seems to me that that's quite an indictment on the papacy. I'm going to close by quoting an author who has said this much more eloquently than I could ever say it. But it's what I'm trying to say tonight. It's rather long, but bear with me. I think it really puts this into focus. He says, The fallacy of the claim of the Pope is the vice regent of Christ is apparent in the glaring contrast between him and Christ. The Pope wears, as a fitting symbol of authority claimed by him, a jewel-laden, extremely expensive crown, while Christ had on earth no crown at all, except a crown of thorns which he wore in our behalf. In solemn ceremonies, the Pope is carried in a portable chair on the shoulders of twelve men, while Christ walked wherever he needed to go. We cannot imagine Jesus, who came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, being carried in luxury on the shoulders of men. The Pope is adorned with people bowing their knee in reverence. He is preceded by the papal cross and by two large fans of peacock feathers, and his garments are very elaborate and costly, all of which is out of harmony with the person and manner of Christ. The Pope lives in luxury, and many servants in huge palaces in Vatican City, while Christ, when on earth, had no place to lay his head. Many popes, particularly during the Middle Ages, were grossly immoral, why Christ was perfect in holiness. Christ said that his kingdom was not of this world and he refused to exercise temporal authority. But the Pope is a temporal ruler, just like a little king, with his own country, his own system of courts, coinage, a postal system, and Swedish military guards, 100 men dressed in 16th century uniforms which serve as the papal bodyguard. I think it all comes down to this. When Jesus was here, he washed feet. The papacy has gotten so far away from that, we now have people kiss the Pope's feet. And that says it all. Find and follow somebody who washes feet and don't kiss any human speaking. <laughs>